this morning is found in John 10, verses 1, verses 1 through 15. A legend was told, a Jewish legend that was handed down through the years. And it was when Moses was out in the wilderness years ago. This was before, uh, this was when he was, you know, on the, on the lamb from, uh, when he was, you know, hiding out from Pharaoh. And the little lamb had wandered off and had gone and Moses like in the parable of the, you know, the good shepherd going from the, you know, the one and leaving the 99, went and found the little lamb, and the little lamb was drinking, and Moses said, oh, was that the only problem? You were thirsty? And Moses put the lamb on his shoulder and took him back, and on his way back, God said to him, I see the way that you treated the little lamb, and now I'm going to use you to save my people. Amen. This is part four, the God we know, the I am sayings of Jesus. I am the good shepherd. And our theme this morning is knowing God's care. Knowing God's care. Please tune in with me. Let's go to John chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls out his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. <coughs> All who come before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lay down, lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd, and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Lord Jesus, I ask in your name, may you richly bless this reading of your holy word. May it change our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I have an Adam and Eve story to tell you. There's a little bit of poetic license in it, but I once heard a preaching professor say uh, that, that he would tell stories and then people would say to him, is it really true? And he would say back to them, it's a story. As you all know, there was trouble between Adam and Eve after the fall. We're going to talk about that more a little later. Adam has blamed Eve for their sin and their problems. And he said, to God, it was the woman you gave me. Adam got tired of working one day, so he stole some things at ShopRite. And he got caught. And he went before the municipal judge. Tough municipal judge. 
The prosecutor had an empty can of peaches that Adam stole. The judge asked Adam how many peaches he ate from the can. He said seven. There were, there were halves, the clean peaches and light syrup. The judge said, did you drink the light syrup too? Adam said he did. Well, the judge said, I'm going to let you off on the light syrup, but for every peach you ate, I'm going to give you a day in jail. Eve couldn't take it. She says, Your Honor, I have to speak. You don't know the whole story. Your Honor, he also stole a can of peas. <laughs> Remember the story because it applies to today's message. Jesus has a wonderful plan for our lives. Verse 7. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters in by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. There's a lot of different images here, but Jesus is talking about sheep pens. He's, he, 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 he's talking about typically you'd have a wall. The sheep would come in at night. And the, the shepherd would lay across the opening when they were all in and literally nothing could get in or, or get out over that shepherd's body. When they would come in, the shepherd would check each sheep out to see exactly what they needed, would examine them and look them over and know what they needed and would, pro would, provide, uh, would provide for them. The Bible says the Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. So a shepherd would provide safety at night. He would also provide adventure during the day. Would take them out to greener pastures. He would give them security. He would also give them adventure. Verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd laid down his life for his sheep. Now it's real interesting. One of the commentaries that I looked up said that Jesus was in very close proximity to Jerusalem. And in fact, some of these sheep, some of these lambs, may have been raised for temple sacrifice. And Jesus turns that upside down. He said, I am the Lamb of God. I will give my life for the sheep. I will give my life for the sheep. Verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. The, the word know here is a word of intimacy. Gnosko. It's about knowing. God bless you. It's about knowing and being known. It's about knowing most importantly, God knowing us. In my studies this week, I found this teaching. It said there's one thing God can't do. <clears throat> oh, I wondered, you know, I, I pondered that for a while. You know, the old thing, you know, can God make a rock so big that he himself cannot lift it? You know, that kind of thing. But there's one thing God can't do. And you know what it is? When he, what's that? Can't fail. Can't fail, amen. It's true. We sing that. God can do anything but fail. But this commentary it said this. When God looks into a large group of people, he can't see a crowd. He sees individuals. When God looks into a large, large group of people, he doesn't see a crowd. He sees individuals, and he knows all about us. One time there was a very eloquent order, and an old preacher in the same group, and the old preacher said to this, this you know, fantastic speaker, hey, please, say the 23rd Psalm. The orator said, I'll do it, but only if you do it after me. So this fantastic accomplished orator, he said the 23rd Psalm, and then... He said to the preacher, I would like you to say it. And in his old gravelly voice, the preacher said the psalm. And it was clear that the people were moved by what he said. 
The orator couldn't resist. He said, you know, he said, I know the psalm, but he knows the shepherd. I know the psalm, but he knows the shepherd. Donald Barnhouse, and a couple of our people enjoyed them last week, Dave Bailey's retreat. Donald Barnhouse once told the story of Chief Justice Hughes joining a Baptist church in Washington, D.C., when he went to be Chief Justice, when, you know, he, and he wanted to join a church. When it came time to receive the members at the end of the service, the, the, the preacher invited people up. He started with a Chinese laundry. His true name, his name was A. A. Long, L-O-N-G. Brought him up, and the guy went to one side of the church. Then he called the other people up. They went to the other side of the church. The China, the Chinaman, the, the laundry guy was off by himself. Chief Justice, when it came time for Chief Justice Hughes to be uh, invited into fellowship in the church, Chief Justice Hughes made a beat on it to stand right next to the laundry man. Though we're known by God, and though we're all different, Chief Justice Hughes knew something that all of us need to remember. We share one thing in common, and that is a need for God's grace. <clears throat> we share one thing in common, and that is a tremendous, overwhelming need for God's grace. Our Lord's credentials are in order. He has a wonderful plan for our lives. His concern for us is clear. He's given his life for us. Paid for our sins with his blood. He knows us inside and out. By the way, it isn't the most complimentary thing in this world that we're, you know, that we're, we're called sheep. And being a shepherd was not, you know, a real, like, highfalutin job back then. In fact, I even looked on YouTube one time, uh, Candid Camera did a, uh, uh, did a, like a career study with college students. And this was all set up and, and they were, you know, they told a group of college students, they took one young man aside and said, you know, we've done your career profile and, and you, uh, it looks like you'd be best suited to be a shepherd. And you know, they showed him sheep and everything like that. And it was on, you know, it was on candid camera. But I, I Google just sheep and what sheep are like. And this is well documented. Sheep are described as dumb, directionless, and defenseless. Is dumb. One sheep, it's been documented many times, one sheep will take several hundred over a cliff. Now where's the analogy? Think Jim Jones. Think Jim Jones. One sheep will take a hundred over a cliff. The directionless, so just go in circles. No idea where they're going. And defenseless. A lone sheep in, in nature is called a snack. A lone sheep in nature is called a snack. Somebody will come along and eat. Eat that thing. Remember the Adam and Eve story? Why did I tell that? Because this is our story since the fall of humankind in the garden. Speaking of the garden, after sin enters the picture, God does three things for sinners. God does three things for sinners. He comes looking for us. Genesis 3.8, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They're hiding. He gives us clothes to cover our shame. Genesis 3.21. And then right in that chapter, he promises us that he will one day overcome the serpent whose lives have been believed. Remember the movie, The Passion of the Christ? The beginning of the movie? The head of the serpent. <coughs> Gone. But it does confess, the Bible does confess that the serpent will cause damage. Will cause damage in the world. A lot of damage. But Jesus will have ultimate victory. 
But until the day that we embrace Jesus, really embrace Jesus, we face brokenness, pain and misunderstanding in relationships. That's in families, in churches, in workplaces. Intimacy is replaced with manipulation and power struggles and put-downs and seductions and defensiveness and the withholding of relationship and loneliness reigns. So like in Genesis, that's the, the chief thing that happens. Relationships are bad. That's not the only thing though. Work is, work gets bad. Adam had a job before the fall. He had a job. He was tending the garden. But now there are thorns and thistles. The ground is hard. It's too cold, or it's too hot, or it's too wet, or it's too dry. The work is hard. Sometimes just to, just to commute. Sometimes we got a three-hour commute. We may accomplish things, but we may never, we never feel completely satisfied. Sense of restlessness and incomplete. Incompleteness. I read a, a passage this week from a book called The Emotionally Healthy Church by a man named Pete, a uh, pastor by the name of Pete Scazzaro. He asked the question, you know, why does God allow this? Why does God allow, like, the problems, the difficulties, the problems with work, problems with each other? Why does God allow this? Well, for one reason, to bring us to Him. It's a true north in life to bring us to Him, to recognize our need for a Savior, to make us want Him more than anything else. And yet, of course, the world has other plans. The world doesn't want us to want Him. In fact, Adam and Eve, they hide. And we hide sometimes. You know, they just, they, they hid. And we hide sometimes, and we can even hide behind good things. You know, our work, you know, our kids, you know, just fill in the blank. Things we hide. Or we, the traditional things are, we, it's fight or flight. We either escape, we try to flee, and there are a lot of ways we can do that. There are a lot of isms out there. And all, not all of the isms are bad, like work. You can escape and work, or flee and work. Or fight. You know, which I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take any prisoners. I'm just going to make my point. I have a question this morning. Very simple question. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He wants to be your shepherd. He wants to be my shepherd. Are you letting Jesus shepherd you? Are you letting Jesus Christ shepherd, shepherd you? Brokenness is the port of entry to the kingdom of God. Brokenness is the port of entry to the kingdom of God. Everyone is broken, damaged, cracked, and imperfect. You know, I said we're all cracked cracks, right? It's a common thread of humanity. Even when we deny its reality, it's in our life. It's in our life. A woman once said, I wish I knew a man who would die for me. And someone heard her say that and said, there is one already. And his name is Jesus Christ. God woke me up from sleep. I was kind of in like a, I don't know if I was actually sleeping, but I was in a trance or whatever. And I felt like God say to me, I, I want you to make this offer this morning. And before me, I know I've done this before. It's been years though. These are handkerchiefs. And these are Jesus' handkerchiefs. And I just pray that they represent for us this morning 
that Jesus is at the gate. And when we come in and go out, when we come in for a safe, safety at night, He's there. And when we go out in the morning, He's there. And just like the Good Shepherd examines us when we come in and go out, He knows exactly what we need. And may these handkerchiefs be an example, may, be, may they be a symbol, may they be a sign for you and for me that Jesus Christ knows exactly what we need. And if you're a woman, I know this is a man's handkerchief, so he says, why do you have a man's handkerchief? Say, it's Jesus's. <laughs> Jesus gave it to me. Because he knows what I need. In fifth grade, Mrs. Slovak, teacher at Bound School, said, <coughs> made us carry a handkerchief. If you couldn't show our handkerchief, you had to write a 50-word composition on why you should have a handkerchief. God bless Mrs. Slovak. She, she's still here. She's still around. God bless her richly. Jesus is the good shepherd. And he has a plan for each of our lives. We're going to sing, I'm going to say a prayer, and we're going to sing. He doesn't just have a plan for our lives, he has a plan for our homes, he has a plan for our church, he has a plan for the kingdom of God, he has a plan for how we fit into the kingdom of God. God is bringing things together. I'm going to say a prayer, and then as we sing the song, Savior, like a shepherd lead us. You're welcome to come up and get a handkerchief. And it may be a sign that you want to let Jesus in. That you want to let Jesus in to let him be your shepherd. To know him as your Savior and Lord. Please pray. Lord, we love you. And we need you this morning. Brokenness is the port of entry into the kingdom of God. Lord, may we open ourselves to you to let you truly be our shepherd. Not just on the surface, but into the deep, dark places. We ask this in your name, and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let us sing together. Savior, like a shepherd, be. Please rise.
handkerchiefs will continue to be here. God is at work. God is at work. Receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of His countenance upon you, give you His peace. This day forevermore.